Hello, Gary Renard. Hi, Lilu. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you for accepting this interview. I'm delighted to have you and, and be one-on-one -on -one with you and, and spread your work. You're actually a best, uh, best-selling author of many books. And, and today there was a, some particular questions that I had around 2012 because a lot of people are, are questioning what is going on right now. Can you tell us about your perception of, of what's happening and, 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 and what is actually the, is, is, is the world that we live in changing? <laughs> oh yes, uh, actually the teachers in my books uh, whose names are Artin and Persa who are uh, two ascended masters uh, they t they've talked to me before about 2012, and also they talk about it in my next book, which will be coming out soon. And uh, they said a lot of interesting things about it. Uh, first of all, they see 2012 as the beginning of a new cycle. Uh, they see it as, as a bigger cycle where things will get bigger, whether they're good or bad. Uh, so believe it or not, uh, despite what a lot of people are predicting, there are going to be a lot of good things that are going to happen. Uh, in the year 2012 and beyond, which is the beginning of this uh, great cycle and a new kind of like period in history. Uh, there are also going to be some very bad things that will happen. That's duality. Uh, no matter what you have going on in the world, there's always good and bad. The difference in this cycle is that it'll be bigger. So, so the things that are bad are going to scare people a lot, uh, which is kind of like what, uh, what I'll call the ego that's what the ego wants. That's the thought of separation from our source, which is spirit. Uh, spirit, on the other hand, will guide us to not be fearful, to be forgiving, uh, no matter what happens. And so uh, we're going to have to remember that in the face of uh, some pretty scary things, such as uh, climate change, uh, the world is not doing enough to prevent climate change. Uh, there were a whole list of goals that countries were supposed to meet by the end of the year that we're supposed to make progress in uh, kind of like solving the problem of emissions going into the air and not one country in the world met its goal not one of them and uh, the problem is accelerating and it's got to, going to get to the point where it'll be kind of like a desperate situation where people become very afraid because things are going to start changing pretty fast and the governments of the world are going to have to scramble uh, just to help the world to survive. So that's going to be uh, probably over the long run, over the next century, the biggest problem that we're going to face. And on the other hand, there are a lot of very good things that are going to happen. Uh, the world's economy is going to expand and uh, there's going to be an economic boom, even though things don't look very good right now uh, in the future. And they're going to be very good because of all this economic expansion and these countries doing business with each other. Uh, my teacher said that the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average in America by the middle of the century will go to the 100,000 level. Right now it's only around 10,000. So uh, that's a huge percentage gain because of all this business that's going to be done with the emerging nations uh, such as China and India and Asia and uh, the European Union is gaining in power. The United States is actually losing some of its power and uh, the value of its currency isn't as strong as it used to be. So you're going to have some very good things going on economically. You're going to have some very bad things going on with the environment. That's duality. Now, how bad or how good it's going to be is being decided by us right now by the thoughts that we have, by whether or not we practice forgiveness, by whether or not uh, we put a positive kind of like, uh, you know, energy in the sense that we're thinking the right thoughts. That is what is going to determine the future. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, uh, there's an Indian tribe in America called the Hobie Indians, and uh, they have these images that they've carved on their rocks that have been there for... Oh, over a thousand years. And what this is, uh, very much like uh, the Mayan calendar does. And when you get to 2012, there are two paths that are going off in two different directions. Uh -huh. That's a choice that we need to make right now. Uh, people think that the future is being decided when it happened. 
No, but decided by the way that we're thinking right now. And whether or not we choose to practice forgiveness, whether or not we choose to think right-minded thoughts with the Holy Spirit, if you will, instead of the ego. So it's like we're making the choice right now as to what our future is going to be like. And that's why it's so important for people uh, to get control of their mind and to get control of their thoughts and to adopt the thought system of the Holy Spirit, which would include love and forgiveness and joining, instead of the thought system of the ego, which is all about the body and about individuality and about getting ahead yeah. and about uh, you know beating other people at things. Uh, it's very important what people choose to think right now. That will determine uh, how good or how bad that next cycle of history is really going to be. So which, which um, th th first of all, that's very informative. Thank you for the richness of this conversation and the generosity and the information you're, you're giving here. But what, what is the time frame we're talking about here when you're saying it's going to get bad before it gets good economically? Are we talking midterm, long-term cycles? Because you say middle, mid, mid of the century. <laughs> that's a long, that's far away. Yeah, well, yeah, it's about 40 years away. And I would say that within... The next 10 things are going to start to get very good. Sorry, can you repeat that? Quite a while. Can you repeat that? Because the internet connection actually went bad. Well, sure. I would say that uh, things are going to start to get uh, pretty good within the next five or 10 years. And they're going to stay that way for a long time. That's why you're going to have that big economic expansion right. that's going to go on. Conversely, uh, the climate. At the same time that the economy is getting better, the climate is going to get worse. So you have that kind of like duality going on with the good and the bad, the yin and the yang, which you always have. And they're kind of like going back and forth uh, in and out of balance and how good it's going to be or how bad it's going to be. And the severity of it or the goodness of it will be determined by the thoughts that we as a collective human race are having. So... Your thoughts, my thoughts, everyone's, they're kind of like uh, combined and they go into the collective unconscious, which is really the place where the universe of time and space is being projected from. And what is going to show up in the projection is the sum total of what we are thinking. That's why uh, A Course in Miracles, which is uh, the main teaching that my teachers uh, go by, uh, the Course points out that what we're seeing out there in the world is actually an outer picture of an inward condition. Uh, for example, people want world peace, but they never get it. And the reason that they don't get it is because of the collective thoughts that we are having as a human race. As long as there is a conflict in the mind, there will always be conflict out there on the screen you know, that we're looking at, because really that's all we're seeing is that outer picture of an inward condition. Mm -hmm. But if you got enough people in the world uh, to practice forgiveness, to achieve inner peace, then peace would have to show up on the outside because that's all we're seeing is that outer picture of what is within. If enough people in the world had peace within them, then you would have peace out there on the screen in what we call the world. And it would have to be that way. Mm -hmm. So is, is there going to be some kind of big reunions or some big association or some big, big, big group of people that we might not even be able to see right now what it's going to look like to create such a shift because one person by one, it, it's, it's not going to happen. We know that. Well, uh, it does actually happen one by one, except it's a lot more people than we think because I believe that there is uh, some kind of a general spiritual awakening going on today on this planet. I think that there are more enlightened people today than there have ever been. Mm -hmm. And I think that because of great spiritual teachings like uh, A Course in Miracles and Buddhism and things like that, I think that people are beginning to realize that it's really uh, the power of the mind that is important. And if you're going to gain uh, the good that comes from that power, then you have to learn how to train the mind, which is why Buddhism is so good for people, which is why the workbook of the Course of Miracles is so good for people, because it actually trains the mind to think along a consistent thought system that is in line with the Holy Spirit rather than the eagle. And I think that uh, 
you know, if enough people do that, and, and it is happening, it's just that uh, you don't hear that much about it because they don't talk about it on the news. Uh, they don't talk about it uh, in the media. And, uh, you know, anybody who is uh, kind of like using different forms of spirituality is shunned by uh, the mainstream news media. They don't want to report, you know, what they're doing. But the truth is, most of the people of the world today do not describe themselves as being religious. They describe themselves as being spiritual, which means that even though it's not being reported very much, spirituality is actually becoming a very personal thing. It's something that is done between you and God or you and the Holy Spirit or you and the source or the Tao or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But it's like people are getting in touch with their own spirituality in a very personal way and reconnecting with spirit. I uh, have traveled uh, to about 20 countries in the last few years uh, because my books are in uh, 20 languages. And uh, it's like I see it everywhere. You know, I meet uh, people every week who are undergoing this uh, general spiritual awakening. So I think it's more prevalent than people realize, and I think it is going to make a difference. What is the, the balance between the mind and the heart? Because a lot of people say, oh, it's all about opening the heart, and, 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 and because this is a really our powerhouse, but you're talking about the mind. So what is, what is the balance? What is the, the uh, equation? <laughs> sure. That's a good question. Uh, my teachers... Uh, they have a little bit different approach because the approach of A Course in Miracles, although grant you most people uh, do not understand A Course in Miracles, but uh, the real approach of A Course in Miracles is a little different than others, which is okay. The approach of Buddhism is a little different than others, and that's okay because they all lead to the same place uh, in the end. But the approach of my teachers is that while most uh, spiritualities try to balance body, mind, and spirit, uh, their approach is that you use the mind to choose between spirit, which is reality. But I'm not talking about an individual spirit. I'm talking about something that is not part of it. It would be all of it. Uh, it would be nothing less than God because it would be exactly the same as its source. There would be no distinction between them. So the kind of spirit that they're talking about is something that is nothing less than God, which is reality. And when they say that you use the mind to choose between spirit and the body, what they mean is that the body is really the ego's uh, symbol of separation. It's kind of like uh, the idea of individuality and personal existence. Now, yes, that's our experience, that we're in a body and that we have a personal existence. Uh, I'm not here to deny that that's our experience. I'm just here to say that it's not true that what we're seeing is not true, that it's actually a false experience, and that our reality is this perfect spirit, which is exactly the same as our source. And it's something that is immortal. It's invulnerable. It's something that can't be touched by anything in this world, something that can't be threatened by anything in this world. Uh, it doesn't have to evolve. It's already perfect, which is why the Tao uh, is absolute stillness. It's because the Tao is perfect. It doesn't have to evolve. Uh, it doesn't have to change. If it had to evolve, then it wouldn't be perfect. Uh, that's also why God is actually perfect love. But we have to remember that if God is actually perfect love, then all that it would know how to do would be to love. If it knew how to do something else, it wouldn't be perfect love. It would be something else. So that's why there's a choice that needs to be made. And I'm not saying that anybody has to give up the world or the body or anything like that. Uh, this is something that is done at the level of the mind where you live your normal life. You know, you, you do the same things that you would ordinarily do if you meet somebody and you fall in love with somebody. You know, you get married. I just got married a little while ago. Nice and it's like that. Uh, Beautiful pictures, by the way. Thank you for sharing them with us. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure. Yeah, we're having a great time. And uh, it's like uh, you live your normal life and you have a good time. Uh, the only difference is that while you're doing it, mm -hmm. you're thinking right-minded thoughts uh, with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit uh, sees everybody as being the same. Even though you still see these different bodies, which is uh, the ego's idea, the ego wants you to think that everybody's different because that's where judgment comes from. You know, you can't have judgment without differences. Mm -hmm. But the Holy Spirit wants us to see everybody as being the same. So what you do at the same time that you're living your life 
and having these relationships, just like Jesus did. You know, Jesus was married uh, to Mary Magdalene, and they had a, a normal relationship, and they loved each other. But the difference with them is is that they knew what the other person really was. They knew how to step back once in a while and look beyond the body and realize that what that person really is is this perfect spirit, which is nothing less than God, exactly the same as God, perfect love, totally innocent, you know, totally worthy of being with God. And they understood that if they thought of that other person the same way as that, then they would also think of themselves as being that. Because the way that the uh, unconscious mind works is that whatever you think about another person is really just going to you. It looks like it's going to another person, but it's actually going to you because there isn't really anybody out there. Because all that we're seeing is a projection, you know, that is being uh, rejected by the unconscious mind. And all through that, God remains perfect, which gives us a perfect home to go home to. So... There's a very important law of the mind that is articulated in The Course of Miracles. And it says, as you see him, you will see yourself. Mm -hmm. That's because your unconscious mind knows everything. Uh, there's not one piece of information in the universe of time and space that your unconscious mind is not aware of. And one of the things that it knows is that there's really just one of us. You know, it may look like there are six and a half billion people out there. Mm -hmm. But there's really just one of us. Uh, there's just one ego appearing as many. That's uh, what the Hindus call uh, the world of multiplicity. Uh, you see all these differences out there when the truth is it's all one. And there's really just one of us. Your unconscious mind knows that. So whatever you think or say, and you don't even have to say it, you can just think it about another person your unconscious mind will interpret whatever you think about somebody else to be a message from you to you about you. And that will determine how you feel about yourself. It will determine what you believe you are. It will determine everything about you. Uh, that law of the mind is articulated once again in the Course. As you see him, you will see yourself, which gives you the power to determine how you feel about yourself. Uh, you could heal depression by uh, training people to think differently, to think differently about other people. And if they could consistently see everybody as being innocent and uh, see them with love, which would be an all-encompassing sort of love, uh, the way that Jesus saw people, he would forgive anybody, didn't matter what they were doing, even when they were killing him. And, you know, that way he could come to experience his own divinity. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you come to experience what you really are and where you really are is by changing your thoughts and changing the way that you think about other people because now you understand that your own unconscious mind is going to determine whatever you think about anybody else to be what you are and what kind of a being you are. So uh, there's a lot of power in that mm -hmm. kind of thinking if you grab it and learn how to use it consistently it determines everything about you, and there's a lot of power there. Uh, there isn't any power in being a victim. Mm -hmm. There isn't any power in being at the effect of the world and ha making like it's being done to you. But what made great masters like Jesus and Buddha different was that they knew something that the world does not know. Uh, they knew that the world was not being done to them, that it was actually being done by them. You know, it was not uh, coming at them, which puts you at the effect of life. Uh, it was actually coming from them, or more accurately, from their own unconscious mind. That's where the projection that you're seeing comes from. And then we're viewing it with the conscious mind. And what we're seeing is just a trick. You know, it's the illusion that has been described by the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Taoists, and today, of course, in miracles. Uh, it's really just a sleight of hand. In reality, is beyond the veil. You know, reality is beyond uh, these bodies that we're seeing. And once again, I'm not saying that you won't see bodies and that you won't have a normal life and, and interact with them. Uh, in fact, uh, as you practice the kind of forgiveness which sees people as being totally innocent, then what happens is the Holy Spirit is actually healing your unconscious mind, mm -hmm. removing uh, this kind of like uh, guilt that goes all the way back 
you know, to the original idea of being separate from God, what some people would call original sin, although in reality there is no sin, but people would call it that. There's a tremendous amount of guilt uh, that's going on deep in the unconscious mind that we can't see, but which runs the world. And what the Holy Spirit does, as you practice forgiveness, is the Holy Spirit heals your mind, removes that unconscious guilt from your mind, and because you feel less guilty, you actually end up enjoying your life more than you would have. Uh, you enjoy everything more when you don't feel guilty. Right. You know, so you don't have to feel guilty about being successful or having money you know, or having sex or having uh, plans or having possessions or things like that. Uh, you know, why should you feel guilty about something that isn't really there in the first place? Why not just enjoy it the same way that you do when you go to the movies? You know, when I go to the movies, which I like to do, I know that it's not real, but that doesn't stop me from enjoying it. So uh, I think that as you practice this kind of spirituality, uh, rather than giving things up, you find out that you just end up enjoying them more. And it's kind of like a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have your cake and eat it too. Because uh, you get to wake up as you go along. And I, it's really awakening that is enlightenment. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what Buddha meant when he said, I am awake. And uh, it's that awakening that is enlightenment. You get to live your life, have a good life, and awaken gradually at the same time. And then when you awaken, what you awaken to is what you really are, which is this perfect spirit that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you uh, when you have self-limiting beliefs, like a lot of us want things in life where we don't think we have the capacity or we're not worthy of it, how do you then interact uh, with others based on the fact that it's this big, huge ego that we all have in common? And how, how, how should we be in life? Yes, uh, as you practice the kind of forgiveness that my teachers teach, and uh, for example, in my first book, uh, which is called The Disappearance of the Universe, uh, which really explains, of course, miracles to people, uh, you know, they have a difficult time understanding it. Uh, and it does explain the course in such a way that they do understand it, not because of me, but because of my teachers. And uh, you understand that as you practice the kind of forgiveness where you come from a position of cause, which recognizes that uh, you're not a victim, that the whole thing was actually made up by you, instead of coming from a place of effect. When you practice forgiveness from that kind of a place, it changes your experience. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because you can interact in a normal way, as I said. The only difference is that you're practicing forgiveness at the same time, kind of like in the back of your mind, where when you go to react to something in a negative way, uh, you stop yourself. You learn how to stop yourself, stop reacting, and, and that may be the hardest part of doing this. You know, it's just to stop yourself from reacting. And then you look at it differently. Uh, you change your mind. You realize that what you're seeing is a projection that is coming from you, so there's really no need for you to be afraid of it. Uh, there's no need for it to affect you. Uh, at one point, A Course in Miracles says of this kind of forgiveness that it denies the ability of anything not of God to affect you. So it's, it's like you're becoming invulnerable uh, to the world. You're getting to the point where, just as it says at the beginning of A Course in Miracles, nothing real can be threatened. Well, what you really are cannot fearless. be threatened. Yes, absolutely fearless. Oh. And you can get to that point, and at the same time, while you practice that kind of forgiveness, it's kind of like your identity starts to shift from the idea of being a body which is separate and which is alone and, and which is isolated, uh, your experience starts to shift to being what you really are, which is spirit. So you may find as you go along that your body will start to feel lighter. Uh, maybe uh, you know, you'll start to feel younger. Uh, I started doing A Course in Miracles 17 years ago, and uh, people who have known me uh, that long tell me that I look younger today than I did 17 years ago when I first started doing this. And uh, there are all kinds of practical benefits of doing it. It's like uh, maybe the body will become more elastic. Maybe it'll be more difficult to hurt it. Maybe you won't feel pain the way that you used to. Uh, it really changes gradually. You know, so uh, you don't feel like uh, your life is being taken away from you or anything, which is one of the beautiful parts about it because it's kind of like uh, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. You know, it doesn't happen in one day. 
uh, there's a process that you go through, you know, just like the caterpillar goes through a process before it becomes a higher life form. Well, what we're doing as we practice this kind of forgiveness is we're gradually graduating to a higher life form. And it really is better to be spirit than to be a body, just like it really is better to be a butterfly than to be a caterpillar because you're not as restricted. Uh, you don't feel uh, like you're so limited. So uh, when I said it was a win-win situation, I mean that, that in the true sense, you really do get to have your life and have a happy life. I'd like people to uh, remember that unlike many other forms of spirituality, mm-hmm. A Course in Miracles is a happy form of spirituality. Uh, it guarantees us a happy resolution to all of this. It says that uh, we're all going to the same place. We're all going to end up in heaven all together uh, without exception. Uh, the only thing is we're not going there as bodies. We're going there as what we really are. We're returning to what we really are, which is this perfect spirit, which is exactly the same as God. And uh, the Course talks about, you know, the happy dream. It talks about uh, being a happy learner. Uh, one of the ten characteristics of a teacher of God in A Course in Miracles is joy. You know, and that's what Jesus was like. You know, people uh, in history have painted him to be some kind of, a, you know, suffering, morose sacrificial kind of a character, this iconic mm-hmm. religious figure, that's not what he was really like. He was happy. Uh, he liked to bring out the joy in other people. He liked to laugh. He liked to tell jokes. You know, he had normal relationships. Uh, he drank wine. You know, he went to wedding celebrations that lasted for two weeks. I mean, you know, the guy was a party animal. You know, and, and it's just like uh, he knew how to have a good time. And if you really look at A Course in Miracles carefully, it doesn't talk about forgiving the good stuff. It doesn't talk about forgiving uh, the beautiful sunsets or the walks on the beach, you know, or romance or you know the art and music that you love or things like that. Uh, the focus of the course is on forgiving the negative emotions. Mm-hmm. It says that anger is never justified. Yeah. So how do you think? How do you think now the religion is going to evolve? I know we're sli- 